Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The Prophet said in that hadith, your love for the surah will make you enter Jannah. Is this true only if one has love for Surah Ikhlas? What if I love to recite Surah Maryam? Obviously, the prophetic stamp was there for that Sahabi. Now, Allah Walam, right? Uh, no, nobody can answer this question definitively at that same level of definitiveness that we can take the understanding from hadith. But uh, if you love to recite Surah Maryam, you may recite it. And Allah Ta'ala may choose to accept that love for Surah Maryam and make you enter Jannah. Can you please elaborate more on the concept of how Bia changed from something that encompassed everything to that of a political leader? Actually, there was a concept of Bia al Khilafa. So, four types of Bia come from the workshop of the Quran and Hadith, which was Bia al Iman, Bia al Jihad, Bia al Hijra, and this Bia al Toba slash Irada. After the time of the Prophet ﷺ came another type of bayah which the Khulafai Rashidun took, which is Bayat al Khilafa. That was their bayah as the leader of the believers, what we call Amir al Mu'mineen. Obviously, Sayyidina Rasulullah was also Amir al Mu'mineen, but he didn't have this title because he was Nabi of the Mu'mineen. So, why would you need to have a title Amir al Mu'mineen? Right? So now that Khalifa from the Khulafa al-Rashidun got this title, Amir al-Mu'mineen. So for them, because they were Khulafa al-Rashidun, it included Shaykh of the Mu'mineen and Mufti of the Mu'mineen and Alam of the Mu'mineen, etc. But after the Khilafat al-Rashida, then the leader position was no longer uh, including the scholarly spiritual aspect. It was just a political administrative uh, aspect. Okay, this is a good question, that some, we know that you also said that historically that people went astray in the Sawwuf, and shouldn't we stay away from those things that could lead to sin? So if the path of the Sawwuf can lead to sin, why should we adopt the path of the Sawwuf? Actually, the path of proper Sharia compliant, the Sawwuf, under the guidance of ulama, that doesn't lead to sin. The path of those Sufis who have this belief that their Sufi practice and Sufi experience can bring them to a reality that is beyond that of the Sharia. In fact, that type of path that lead, leads you to sin. So you should not adopt your right that you should absolutely stay away altogether from the path of the misguided Sufis, even though they are other good things that they do in terms of they do love Allah Ta'ala, they do love the Prophet they do make a lot of zikr, they might make a lot of charity, but you must stay away from that. Second, it's a misconception, which is also part of the question, that a lot of people went astray. So I'll give you another example that people often quote to try to scare people away from the Sawwuf. Now, first of all, I can't be scared from the Sawwuf because Tazki is fard. And I've showed you too much now from the Quran and Sunnah model. But they will scare you that there was once one person, his name was Mansur al Halaj, and he said, An al Haq. He claimed that I'm Allah. Billah. So therefore, if you start doing a lot of zikr, what if you end up like Mansur al-Halaj? Huh? akbar So out of the billions of people in the history, one person became like that. Here, so it's like me telling you, well, there are some people who accepted Islam, and later on they became murtad, they left Islam. So are you going to accept Islam? Because there's a person in history who accepted Islam became murtad. It's a first, again, logical fallacy. When you're supposed to use logic, you don't use it. And where you're not supposed to use logic, you use it. It's strange. This is another strange condition of the modern predicament. All right? Anyway, I will answer the question because that's another thing that Imam al Banat explained beautifully. Why did Mansur al-Halad say this, An al haq What happened to him was that he had made so much zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why also the method of zikr makes a difference. So he was following a method of zikr which is... Uh, first making zikr of la ilaha illallah and then making zikr of Allah Ta'ala's name Allah. So what he did, he first made the zikr of la ilaha illallah so he did nafi, la, negation of everything. And he kept doing it, kept doing it deep. He immersed himself in that zikr. Such that he had negated his awareness of everything except for Allah Ta'ala. This isn't reality, this is his experience that a level of consciousness that he brought himself to. Like for example, when you dream, and if it's a very deep dream, what now they call REM sleep, you will, and if, let's say you have a dream that you're in Makkah Makarma, you will actually think you're in Makkah Makarma. You will reach this level of being, a state of being, where you actually think that. 
So he entered the state of being that he had negated his awareness of everything except for Allah Ta'ala. Then on top of it, he started doing the zikr of Allah Ta'ala's name. So he became completely aware of Allah Ta'ala. So he was completely unaware of all ghairullah and completely aware of Allah Ta'ala. So if at some point after how many days or weeks or months he was like this, when he snapped out of it, his first statement, like upon waking from a dream, I'm in Makkah. Right? Which is not correct. You are sitting in Karachi. <laughs> right? So as soon as he popped out of that zik state, he said, Anul Haq. What he didn't mean that I, Mansur al am Haq. His concept of Ana was different actually. He had negated his own self-conception. He had entered what they call Fanafid La. So what he meant is, I have removed every single awareness of myself. I'm only aware of Allah Ta'ala. Now what I am aware of is Allah. <laughs> All my awareness is awareness of Allah. That's what he meant. Now when he, that was when he first snapped out of it. Now later on, and this is also written that they don't tell you, he was in prison for this. So when a sheikh, Jinnid Baghdadi, went to meet him in jail, his sheikh is the one who signed his execution warrant. Sheikh! <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I better sound like the Sheikh who also does this. <laughs> but Mansur Halaj told him in jail that, yeah, I'm out of this now. This isn't my kid, but you're right to execute me lest anybody ever be misguided by this statement in the future. Misguided means, number one, lest they be misguided and think that they can reach a state that they become Allah Ta'ala and misguided lest they think that this is the tradition of Tasawwuf. So, Shaykh, you execute me so nobody ever thinks this is Tasawwuf. But mashallah, certain people revive this and exactly this they're trying to do. The Mansur al-Halaj died so that people would not think that this equals Tasawwuf. And you want to resurrect this and say this is Tasawwuf, the people will do zikr. And so, why should I put myself on a path that has a risk of this? This is like a one in 100 billion believers who had this statement. And even that, he snapped out of it instantly. All right? Okay. Please explain how high-level Sufism should be dealt with by layman. Not at all. Layman, low-level person should do low-level to so with. Leave sin. That's it. No problem. <laughs> Leave sin, do zikr. Don't worry about it. That's why I showed you one text. Actually, I prepared a whole document. But I realize actually exactly what you're saying, that you shouldn't be doing these high-level things. No need to quote-unquote high-level aspects, all right? Basically, the tabirat of the experts, the expressions of the experts are not normally understood by the layman. Like I've told you before, there's a field of science called popular science. Those are the scientists who write at a level that can make it on the New York Times bestseller list, which means an ordinary educated person can read that. There's another level of science with the hardcore journal articles that only fellow scientists can read and understand. The fact that they are not able to be understood by an ordinary person should not make you suspicious of them. It just means you won't be able to understand it, right? So there is some expert knowledge which you may not be able to understand. In light of Imam Rabbanat is saying that uh, you and Allah SWT are completely different even in attributes. So when Allah SWT, and this is something I explained in a lecture a few days ago, تَخَلُّكُ بِخُلُقِ اللَّهِ Sayyidina Rasulullah SAW said that you should adorn yourself with the attributes of Allah SWT. There's no resemblance here. No matter how merciful you are, your mercy will be nothing like the Mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next question. How do you distinguish additional nafil ibadah from bidah? So like I told you, any addition that is made or any additional method that is made or any additional practice of worship that is made, right? So for example, this two rakats, the hitul wudu, for example, adding, okay, this may be, let me add it to you. It's not just additional method, it's adding questions, hiding something. That was the slides that were there for you. That one is to add a method of nafil ibada. One is to add an ibada itself. I should actually have classified that to you. So Sayyidina Biladun added this two rakats nafil upon making wudu. So that's an additional ibada. Later we call that salat tahit al wudu, right? So you can add an additional ibada. And you can add an additional method in ibadah as long as it's in the realm of nafil. Let me show you an example of zikr. 
So, for example, somebody goes to their sheikh and says, "The sheikh, I know that we're all going to die, and I know the Prophet some said the wisest person is the one one who remembers death the most." So, I read this in hadith. I've been given a goal, content. What's the method? How am I supposed to remember death? I find that in reality, I never think about it. Okay, I never think about it. So now you need to develop a method. So, for example, the sheikh will tell him, "Okay, every night before you to sleep, before you sleep." I want you to recite 100 times inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon and reflect on, upon your death. Now there's no hadith where the Prophet told any sahabi that to recite inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon 100 times before you sleep. So this is an example of the zikr that the Mashaikh make. It is from the Quran and hadith. It will have some basis, right? But it's quote unquote new in the sense that the Prophet never told any sahabi to do that. So now the test will be what? That the test, because this nafal ibada is what? Is there anything in it that's against Quran and Sunnah? Is there anything in Sharia that is being violated if a person recites in lillahi wa inna ilayhi a hundred times before going to sleep? Nothing. So there's nothing in it that's khilaf i Quran, khilaf i Sunnah, khilaf i khilaf i Sharia. So it's acceptable. So it won't be called a bidah. Alright? Okay. If, however, somebody says, teaches you a method of zikr, that you should do that method of zikr, and men and women should be sitting together such that they can see each other. So that's a problem, because now you've adopted a method of zikr that is against the sharia, so that method is bidah. You say, I want you to do a method of zikr that you will dance in kawali while smoking hashish. You can go. So that's a method which is against sharia, so that's a bidah. Right? Okay, so whether it's a method or a new way of worshipping Allah Ta'ala, new way of worshipping, but it can only be nafil ibadah, new type of zikr, it cannot be against the Qur'an, Sunnah, and Sharia. Salatul Tasbih, Salafi say it is a bidah, but other ulama refer to a hadith. Okay, this is a very good example. Actually, one Salafi scholar has actually written a very nice book, which I read about a year and a half ago in England and I ordered it and I just recently got my own personal copy of it where he brilliantly argues that Salatul Tasbih is a Salah. Salatul Tasbih is a Salah. Now what's happened here is that some contemporary, not classical, very contemporary and not very scholarly, some contemporary less than scholarly quote unquote Salafis have actually forget ibadat that aren't mentioned, even ibadat that are mentioned in Hadith they have questioned the authenticity of those hadith and then decided to try to label those ibadat as bidah. So one of the best examples is Salatul Tasbih. But that is a very intense scholarly discussion that's beyond something you could read. Uh, but Bara, I just was trying to correct this, that this isn't correct to say the Salafis say it's bidah. There are certain contemporary popular speaker Salafis who think it's a bidah. The Salafi scholarly tradition does not necessarily view it as a bidah. And it is mentioned in different hadith. And I think that's a brilliant, but somebody one day will have to put that in English. But that is a brilliant explanation of how Salatul Tasbih is 100% acceptable. All right? So there are a couple of issues like that now. For, I can't really answer the questions they've asked because that requires a detail beyond this. So actually, I would just say this, that if there's any particular practice you want to know, whether it's bidah or not, sometimes there's a very deep investigation that has to take place. Right? And you will find sometimes very lengthy 10 page, 20 page, 40 page, 50 page articles on this. I will just give you some lists, alright? Salatul Tasbih, not bida. Isal is Sawab, not bida. Milad Nabi, bida. Niaz, bida. Right? Urs, bida. What else do we have here? Fasting on 15 Shaban, strictly speaking, not bida, but some people have inserted some bidah into it. Okay? Uh, by saying that Salafis have contradicting views, does this mean the sect of Salafis nowadays or the Salaf Sali? No, I'm talking about the Salafis nowadays. Next, by labeling yourself to affiliation to groups, does it not contradict the label of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called us one thing. Inna dina inna Allah islam That the deen is of Islam. But you have to look at historical realities, understandings have emerged, you will have to say something. For example, sometimes people ask me that, why can't we just say we're Muslim? So the first question, they start from the top. 
why do I have to say that I'm a Sunni or a Shia? I says, it's very simple. Do you believe that Umm Min Sayyidah Aisha is a believer or she's a non-believer? They say, now, they can answer this in three ways. Either they can say, I believe she's a believer. Or they can say, I believe she's a non-believer. Or they could say, I leave this matter up to Allah SWT. This third is also not acceptable. This third answer is also not acceptable. Therefore, you must take a position. Once you make, take a position, you immediately become either Sunni or Shia. Immediately. Second example. Do you believe the Qur'an that we have today is complete? Or do you believe that there are ten Jews with the twelfth Imam who is hiding in a cave and will bring those ten Jews back when Imam made as the Mahdi towards the end of time? person can answer in three ways. I believe the Qur'an we have it is the complete original Qur'an as revealed by Allah Ta'ala to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Second, they can say, I believe that ten Jews are missing and the twelfth Imam will bring it back. Third, they can say, only Allah Ta'ala knows. That's also incorrect. <laughs> if anybody says, only Allah Ta'ala knows if this is the complete Qur'an or there's anything missing, that's not Islam. <laughs> Islam is you have to believe that the entire Qur'an as it is is complete. So you must make a choice. Now once you make a choice on these, now this is Aqidah theology, I'm not doing fiqh. You always have to keep in mind, Aqidah is separate, fiqh is separate, alright? There's nothing to do with mother, there's nothing, I'm talking about theology now. You must make a choice on this. You cannot say I have no position on this. You must decide to believe you must be able to say the entire Quran is complete. As soon as you make a choice, and there's several other such questions in this list, you will, without exception, without escape, necessarily be either Sunni or Shia. Now, you want, you can make that, that the questioner can make that decision that Sunnis are Muslims, Shias are non Muslims. I'm not going to get into that right now. But you have to say this are you Sunni or Shia? There's no way you can be both, and there's no way you can be neither. It's not possible. It's not logically possible. Again, this is where you should, it's not logically possible that you can do this. Okay, now let's see you into the Sunni realm. So you have to take one of two positions. Either you believe that the understanding of the Quran and Hadith will be done on the basis of usul and fiqh from these four madahib, or you believe that they will be done without usul and without fiqh, and either directly or through Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al juziyah and Muhammad al Wahhab and contemporary Saudi scholars who follow them. These two cannot be combined. These are mutually exclusive positions. And then there's a whole bunch of other such questions that can be asked. Do you believe that there's more than one valid way to pray according to Sunnah? Or do you believe that there's only one way that can be called Sunnah? Do you believe that Tarawih is 20 rakats? Or do you believe it's 8 rakats? So there's this whole set of questions where all four madahib and all of the Sunni tradition has agreement. And the quote-unquote Salafis have departed from that consensus. So when you go through that list, you will have to pick. <laughs> Whatever you pick, you will end up being either... Ahl Sunnah will Jama'ah, Sufi, Sunni, or you will be Salafi Sunni. It will happen by default. Whether you choose to name yourself, it doesn't matter. It's a reality. Taking off the tag doesn't do anything. When you cut the tag from this, it's a, it's a bonanza vest. If I cut it off, it's still a bonanza vest. <laughs> so you say, I just want to be Muslim. You're still Sunni. <laughs> you take the word Sunni off. I still call you a Sunni. You say, no, no, I'm only Muslim. I say, you're Sunni. Yeah. You say, I'm just Muslim. I say, no, you're Salafi. <laughs> this is, and this is something that the Salafis have done also. They actually don't like to... In, in Pakistan, this is more the case. In the West, actually, they very vocally self-identify themselves as Salafi. In Pakistan, many of them are what I call stealth Salafi. They don't like... They say, no, no, we just believe in the Quran and the Hadith. We're nothing. Right? When actually, in reality, they are something. Right? So taking the label off doesn't change what you are. All right? Uh, this is incorrect. The questioner says that even the Prophet ﷺ had doubt when he received his first wahi, whether it was from Allah Ta'ala or not. No. Uh, you have to get your aqidah very clear on this. Sayyidina Rasulullah had no doubt whatsoever. He did not fully understand the experience that was taking place and what he was being tasked with and what type of burden was coming upon him. Right? That's the most you can say. However, I personally found the theological that he 100% understood and that's why he ran to his wife, Umm, and he said, the Khadija and said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, enshroud me, cloak me, protect me, hug me, right? Because he understood immediately exactly what had happened. 
But to say he had doubt, uh, that's an acceptable expression in my understanding. All right? I heard that company of pious people is better than the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah ta'ala says the remembrance of Allah ta'ala is the greatest thing. All right. So there's different texts where you will find this word greatest. For example, Walla dhikrullahi akbar. So the zikr of Allah ta'ala is the greatest thing. Another verse, Walla dhwanum min Allahi akbar. That Allah ta'ala's pleasure is the greatest thing. Then if you go to hadith, Abzul al mali. There's many hadith. I think there are about 17 or 19. Once a person did a whole workshop on this, they compiled the hadith with them, the best of actions. Abdul Amal, the best of actions of Allah. And there's about 17 or 19. I can't remember what he did. One scholar compiled this. They're different things. And he tried to, tried to explain. And the answer of that was that the Prophet wasn't talking about an absolute best. There was, you know, multiple things that were best. All right? So actually what we have to do is practice entirely. For example, sometimes people get too nitpicky. That's the question. Should I make dua or should I recite Quran or should I recite salawat or should I make zikr la ilallah? Salat means dhrut shrif. Or should I make zikr of Allah's name? What should I be doing? You should be doing a bit of all of those things because this is why Allah Ta'ala perhaps because he knew of the boredom in humanity. He created multiple ways of worship. You do not need to definitively find what is supposedly the quote-unquote best one, right? And even if you find the hadith, and there are hadith like I told you, where the Prophet said, Abzul A'mali, that the best action is something, it doesn't mean you leave the other actions. It doesn't mean you leave the other actions. So, for example, this was a mistake that some people had about zikr, so they ended up being very monastic. So said Allah Ta'ala said that the zikr of Allah is the greatest thing. So that's it. They disengaged from society, stopped doing khidmah. They just did zikr all the time. But no, dawah is greater than zikr. But I can't prove that to you from a single text. Again, this is the usuli understanding. The whole spirit of the text combined leads to this understanding that dawah is greater than zikr. Zikr is more important than dawah when you're doing zikr for your own tazkiyah. So that's fard. Once your fard tazkiyah is done, means you've left sin and you have virtue, now dawah is better than making zikr. Dawah is better than making zikr. So what's best is relative to a person, even within their own stage of life, and relative to between different people. So you shouldn't... And oh, to get back to your question, to your question, for the person who can't make a lot of zikr, for that person it's better for that person to be in the company. Because you see, when I sit down to make zikr, I can't do more than 10 minutes on my own. But I can go and I, I'm happy to sit three hours through the workshop. Yeah, <laughs> right? So it, all of these things depend, right? So there's nothing that you want to extend too far. Okay, there's a hadith that the Prophet of Islam, that Abzul zikri la ilaha illallah, that the best zikr is la ilaha illallah. So what does that mean? You're going to stop reciting Quran? You will never do the of Quran? Because the Prophet best zikr is la ilaha illallah. So this literalist understanding, and again, taking out one text one, even a verse, you cannot take a single verse and privilege that over the rest of the Quran and Hadith. So what will you literally, if you take that Hadith, so I'll combine this to the questioner, well, the zikr Allahi akbar, and to, the zikr is the greatest thing. And abzul the zikr la ilallah, the best zikr is to la ilallah. So that's it, you're finished. Don't make dua, don't recite Quran, don't recite the root shrif, leave all other nawafil and only do zikr la ilallah. Ila ila. No, that's not what Deen is teaching, all right? Okay. Okay. If we can have new method in nafil ibadah, can we have a new method in nafil salah? All right. Now I want to explain a slight, more refined, another round. Right? There, strictly speaking, there are five categories of action. I will say it in English, and then I will say it in Arabic, because there are many Arabic words, and you need to be clear on this. One is obligatory. Second is recommended, third is permissible, fourth is offensive, fifth is prohibited. Obligatory means fard and wajib, both. Fard and wajib, both. Recommended means sunnah muakkada, sunnah ghair muakkada, and nafil, and nafil is also called mustahab and mandub. Permissible means halal or mubah, offensive means makruh tahrimi and 
makruh tanzihi, and prohibited means haram and makruh tahrimi according to the more precautionary position. And some put makruh tahrimi in offensive and not in prohibited. Now understand when I told you nafil, what I meant was that neither farz, nor wajib, nor sunnah. And when I said sunnah, that includes sunnah the ghair muqadda. Sunnah for the Hanafi, so the non Hanafi don't have this distinction. Only Hanafi fiqh has a further subdivision of Sunnah between Muqadda and Ghair Muqadda. So for the Hanafi, even if there's enough, even if there's a Salah that is Sunnah Ghair Muqadda, that's also from that category that you cannot invent your own method of doing Sunnah Ghair Muqadda Salah. Alright? Okay. It's only for Nafil. For example, if somebody says, as an example, it's not really inventing a salah, it's performing. For example, like Sayyidina Bilal, if somebody says that every time my children come home from school, I pray two rakat salah. Fine, you can do that. Now, another person saying that's bidah, because did the Apostle some ever do that or tell anybody to do that? No, the Apostle never did that and never told anybody to do that. But you can do that if you want. No problem. You can do that. But it doesn't mean you've invented, so I shouldn't use it doesn't mean you've invented salah to children coming home. It doesn't mean you've not invented a salah. Right? But you could do that if you want. You could do that if you want. If you say that every day, right before I sleep, I pray two rakats before I sleep, no problem. You can do that if you want. All right? But the other person would say, no, you can't because the Prophet never did it and never told anybody to do it. Now you're getting an idea, right? So maybe the word invent was a bit in a, it's too strong, and so it's good that somebody pointed it out. The hadith in Sahih Muslim, Man sanna fil islami sunnatan hasana, can also be used by the people inventing rituals of dancing nowadays with the justification that the methodology and practice does not go against the Quran and Sunnah. So, what's the position of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Alright, strictly speaking, it depends what you mean by dancing. Alright, so. Dancing, when you think of it in the Western context, I means men and women dancing together, so that's absolutely haram. Nobody can call that a sunnat and hasana. <laughs> you can't call it a hasana. But again, I can't give you a single text. You see, there's no text that says dancing in concerts is prohibited. You can't find that in the textual sources. You have to get the understanding from the text. All right? Now, that type of dancing is prohibited, number one, because there are texts that prohibit musical instruments. There are texts that prohibit free mixing between genders. So those texts are what are going to be. So if a person says that, okay, I, let's say, I think this is a woman who asked this question, if I picked it up from that pile, if I'm correct. Okay, a man or woman, let's say either one says, alone in my house, in my room, without any music whatsoever, I quote unquote dance. All right. So I don't know exactly what that means, but let's say I do some type of movements with my body. So fine, yeah, it's not haram. If, if that's all it is, that you're in your room, in your home, and there's no music, and you just stand up and you start wiggling around, fine, that's strictly speaking not haram, but it's something else. It's called lagh. This is in Quran. Allah Ta'ala mentions Surah Mu'minun. Wa humana laghwi mu'ridun. That the believers, they stay away from futile acts. Fuzul. In Urdu, lagh is fuzul. So what, that type of dancing is fuzul. Right? Okay, so to call it sunnat and hasana, hasana again means the husn in it is it's a method or practice or methodology that reaches a goal and content articulated from the sharia. Okay, let's say that person insists that, well, what I do is I dance in my room and there's no music and there's no mixing of gender. I'm alone, it's my room. And that dancing makes me remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They make that claim. All right. So I would say, okay, that's a claim you have made. I have no way to independently verify that. So what I would do with such a person, I would say, okay, look, this is what I told you. This is what I told you. The danger is, this is why, if you remember, I said, I strongly recommend and prefer that if you don't find a method or practice or methodology from Rasulullah <laughs> drop down one level and take it from the Siddiqeen, Sadiqeen. Don't make it yourself. I already covered this for you. Because of the danger, when you make it yourself, you will use your uncle, you will use your nafs, you will come up with such a concept that dancing alone in my room makes me remember Allah Ta'ala. 
Allah Alam, I can't verify that. But what I do know is there are methods and practices and methodology zikr that Allah Ta'ala opened for the Siddiqeen Ilham. Yes, some of it just like a faqih mujtid also got ilham from Allah Ta'ala when they were doing ijtihad. So these top ulama called mujtahid, top uliya, they got ilham from Allah Ta'ala about these methods of zikr. Second, those methods of zikr have a track record that they make a person reach the goal that they leave sin and become more virtuous and have better akhlaq and more haya and they have more feelings and salah. Your method is from your own akal, from your own nafs with no track record. So at the least I will say I can't comment on it or otherwise I would say that no, I think this is not the right way to go. But strictly speaking, I cannot give you the fatwa that it's haram to wiggle around in your room alone if you want to call it dancing. All right? Okay. But still, I would say, you can't use this hadith though. That much I would say. You want to bring it on your room, you can't call it a sunnatun hasana though. You have no basis to call that hasana. Alright? So same thing. Some Sufis are instructing zikr such as running in circles, vibrating, shiverings, which apparently doesn't vice it, but looks funny and fake, which would be about the same thing I told you. Follow a method that goes back to the Siddiqui. By the way, there's no historical proof that Mulana Rum Rimulatala himself did this whirling dervish thing. This is something that's done in his name, but you cannot historically trace it back to him either. Because there's no mention of it in any of it. And he has left a lot of written works. It's not just the Masnavi. And he doesn't talk about this in any of his writings. Alright? Okay? But, uh, you know, uh, so like I said, it's better to go back with a proven method. So better to follow the method of the awliya. You, you saw. I'll give you another example. La khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzunun. So there's no fear on them. So this I could also interpret it. I don't. This is a stretch. This is turning the knob. I'm telling you openly this is a stretch. But I could turn the knob and say, La khawfun alayhim. Now that they're awliya, there's no fear on them. means whatever methods of zikr they make, they don't have to worry. They're not going to go astray. Allah is protecting them. Allah will put barakah in that method of zikr. Allah will make that method of zikr actually transform the hearts of the people. For example, that sheikh who told his student that recite inna lillahi when it a hundred times before you go to sleep, that student's going to come back after ten days, believe me, and say, the sheikh has worked now, now I remember death, I've understood now. These things work. <laughs> These things work. So one method is fine if you don't accept, like Imam Azad said, you try it then. The Quran can say, you try it. As long as it's not against sheikh, you can try it. So you can say, Shaykh, I don't know, my Salafi friend told me to recite in the law a hundred times as bidda. But the other, I went to another Shaykh, he told me it's fine. So let's say I'm going to try it and see if it makes me remember death anymore. Alright? And the other one, there was another one who said to wiggle in my room will make me remember death anymore. You try that also. You try the dancing and you try the inna lillahi a hundred times. You try the zikr of the awliya and you try the zikr of your akal and you see which one. Because either way, even the zikr of awliya is just a method. Remember, it's not content and goal. So see which one gets you the goal. <laughs> right? If you tell me wiggling in your room makes you remember death, so be it. <laughs> right? What am I supposed to do? Right? Okay, something, uh, there's something called the Esani intellectual tradition. Actually, I will tell you that there is another contemporary, there's many ways that people go astray in Islam. So one way that there was a tradition of Sufism that went astray was what I told you, these popular folk practices of tombs and shrines and grave worship and urs, etc. There's another way, which is a highly, there's two more ways. Tell I'll just do one of them, which is a highly sophisticated intellectual way that you find on these educated elites. And what is that? that they believe in what is called the universal validity of all religions. This is a philosophy called perennialism. Unfortunately, Joseph Lombard is a perennialist. Yeah, so this is a perennial school, the perennial school of thought. Sayyid Hussain Nasser, Fitzjof Shuan, Titus Burkhardt, Guy Eaton, Martin Lings, Joseph Lombard, Sayyid Hussain Nasser. Uh, there are a few more, but these are five, six, seven of their big names. Yeah, yeah, perennialist. So what do they view? They had another incorrect view. They viewed that Sufism is the real religion and every other thing is its shell. So the real religion is Sufism. First it had the shell of Judaism, then it had the shell of Christianity, now it has the shell of Islam. And therefore they believe that if there's a Christian or Jewish Sufi, 
they are equally valid as a Muslim Sufi. All right. So this is incorrect, and one simple answer for this is again, what Allah Taala said: "Inna dina in the Allah al-Islam." But now the only Deen that Allah Taala has validated is the Deen of Islam. So then what they tried to do is they came up with this fancy term called the Ihsani intellectual tradition. So what they do is they say that rather than Iman, Islam, Ihsan working on all three, the real thing is Ihsan. The purpose of Iman and Islam is to get Ihsan. So in our deen we do with Islam, what laws do we follow? The five pillars. The Jews get Ihsan through some other way. Christians get Ihsan through some other way. So this is what they call the Ihsan intellectual tradition. This is a short explanation of that. All right. Yeah, so this I explained to you yesterday. Oh, okay. So those questions such as test you baby, etc., that were utterly unimaginable years ago to the great scholars of Islam, but at the same time need some expert ruling today. So to what role does secular knowledge have in them? So yes, you must consult the expert, but it doesn't mean that the alim and mufti has to be an expert in that field. It's just like in a court of law. So when there's some matter that affects that, case so the judge calls what we call an expert witness to testify so let's say it would be an issue like this in islamic court of law a doctor would be called to testify the doctor would explain exactly what the process is to have a test tube baby the mufti would cross-examine the doctor until both the mufti and doctor feel content even the doctor has to certify that now he has understood what it is now, whether the doctor agrees with the fatwa or not, but the doctor expert has to certify that the scholar, the Islamic scholar who is going to give the scholarly ruling, the expert must attest that he has understood what this thing is. And it's his job to explain it to them. There has to be collaboration. So whatever the area is, you have to have expert testimony. So an alim who doesn't fully understand what exactly it, it means to have a test tube baby is not qualified to pass a fatwa on this ruling even if he may be a great wali of Allah Ta'ala, a lot of taqwa, deep knowledge of tafsir, incredible knowledge of hadith, wonderful knowledge of fiqh, he lacks one ingredient, which is understanding what exactly a test tube baby is. At the same time, the doctor, all he has to sort of, he doesn't have to reach the level of the molecular biologist or doctor, but whatever is sufficient knowledge to understand the shari hisiyat, the, the sharia aspect of that phenomenon. All right? It's not that difficult actually, right? This is actually my field. I taught this for five years at Al Khan, right? So I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but it's not that difficult to get an understanding of these things to the extent that is required to understand what would be the Islamic position on it, all right? How can I practice the self when I cannot find Oliya? Yes, you have to find somebody who you feel content with to be your guide if you have not found someone like that yet, keep searching. If Allah, furthermore, if Allah Ta'ala so highly regards the dua of a wali of his, does that negate the concept of self-accountability? No, it doesn't. No matter how much that wali's du'as may be accepted, he will still be accountable for all of his actions and deeds on the Day of Judgment. That's something else. <laughs> but yes, Allah Ta'ala accepts his du'as, right? I know the philosophical mind is thinking, but what if he sins and make du'a that Allah forgive my sin? So he's good to go, he's got this. No, because if he sins, he's no longer a wali. <laughs> he will lose his wilaya if he does. He may, Allah Ta'ala knows best, but it's possible if he sins, he loses his wilaya and he's no longer that his du'as are accepted. So you make du'a to Allah Ta'ala forgive me for the sin I just did, because I did it for this reason that I knew you accept my du'a, so I thought I could sin and make the du'a and get, get over with. But if you thought like that, you lose your wilaya. <laughs> All right. That's it. Tere swa karte. Hamare ekstas from aate the ke tere ungli se bhi kabi ghi ne kaanna padta hai. So don't think like that. No, no. Uh, if no, any person, the fact that Allah accepts your du'a doesn't mean you are not accountable. Every single person will be asked on the day of judgment. There's no level which anybody can reach. Even that level, mahboob, makbool, wali, they're still accountable for their book of deeds and the day of judgment. All right? Among the leaders of different madhabs these days, there are some who respect others' madhab as correct and and some who label them as incorrect. Okay. 
if there is anybody from this tradition of scholarship in Sunni Islam, known as Madhab tradition, Fiqh tradition, Usul tradition, who declares another Madhab is wrong, that is incorrect. This is what we call Ta'asub or Ghulu. Sometimes they get partisanship in them. They get fanaticism in them. So this is incorrect and this is wrong and this should be spoken against. All right. What does happen when they do the rounds of comparative assessment of evidences, arguments, reasons, running the box, they won't call the other position invalid, but sometimes they will call it incorrect. So how can I explain? That, for example, the example I gave you, Imam Manifa will say, the Hanafis will say, that the Shafi position that bleeding does not break wudu, that's incorrect. And the correct position is that bleeding breaks wudu. Is it valid for somebody to follow the Shafi position? Yes. When? When they have chosen to adopt Shafi Usul and Madhab. For a person who adopts Shafi Usul and Madhab, since you said it's valid, if they don't make wudu <coughs> after bleeding, is it correct for them? Does yes, it's correct for them, it's not correct for us. So they will say it's correct for them, it's not correct for us. Like the example I took in physics. So they're sitting at the conference, presenter, one says light is particles, the other one said light is waves. He says it's correct for him, it's not correct for me. <laughs> that's what he'll say, all right? So this happens in scholarship. So that's the notion of pluralism, all right? <clears throat> what is the path of test care for women? They cannot go for 40 days. No woman does not need to do that. That's why there were no female sahabiyat who were ashab al sufa so Allah Ta'ala has blessed women that men many times have to make more sacrifice the woman will get the same thing in her home. For example, the Prophet said for a man, the best prayer of a man is in jama'ah, in the masjid. Right? You get 27 times more rod when you pray in congregation. The best prayer for a woman in the most, the most secluded corner of the most secluded room of her house. So they're different standards. So the, uh, Islam is, is neutral in gender in these things. The women should not think that they have to compare themselves to the men. So you shouldn't think like that, that, oh, I'm, I can't go to the masjid and pray in jama'ah, so how do I get that fazila? No, but that was for him. You're, you get that fazila by praying in the secluded corner of your room. Right? Similarly, there was a question here, now that reminds me, that you had mentioned the other day that men can listen to, uh, men pray jama'ah. And women, don't, they don't pray Jummah, right? No problem. Whatever the man gets by praying Jummah, you will get by praying in your place. As far as other things, right, as far as, like, we have invited the women here, they're downstairs. So as far as educational activities, other things, obviously women participate. As far as prayer, women also pray. But Allah Ta'ala has preferred their prayer alone and in their room and their house. And Allah Ta'ala has preferred the prayer of the men in a group in the masjid. So you have to do whatever Allah Ta'ala prefers. No gender should look at the other gender. All right? It's like a man asking me, no man has ever asked me this question, but another woman will understand. It's like a man asking me that Allah Ta'ala will stare at a woman's face with love if she wears niqab. How can I get Allah Ta'ala to stare at my face with love? <laughs> right? I said, don't compare. You have other ways to do that. Right? It doesn't mean you go wear niqab. <laughs> it doesn't mean the man should wear niqab. All right. So it's different. It's different. What brought Ibn Arabi to the point of Wadu the Wajud that was similar to what I told you about Mansur al Halal? Similar but not identical. What uh, answer would I give to a certain group of people who say that everything they do is for the goal, content, meaning of love for the Prophet Wasallam? The answer we give them is fine, you can adopt any method to get that goal as long as that method is not against the Quran, Sunnah and Sharia. Is reciting not against it? No, not is perfectly fine. Can you have mefil and not? Sure, if you want people, to, if people voluntarily wish to gather together, and somebody comes and recites poetry in love of the Prophet Sallam for one hour and they wish to sit and listen to it, it's perfectly just, no problem. And in fact, the first person who recited not the Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi was a Sahabi, his name was Sayyidina Hassan ibn Thabit Sayyidina Rasul himself told him 
that this is you you you're a poet you recite poetry this was the human resource management of the prophet sallallahu he knew khad ibn mudid you're going to make jihad abay ibn kaab you recite quran oh hasan ibn sabit you recite poetry abu huraira you're a sahab sufa you stay over here yeah, this is human resource management of nabiy kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's also a sunnah Uh, does the Sheikh have a specific form of zikr? Yes, Sheikh has a specific form of zikr. So the specific form of zikr that Sheikh follows is the form of zikr method of Imam Rabbani Sheikh Ahmad Sir Hindi Namtali. So that form of zikr consists of a few things. This will be the last question, then we have to go for Maghrib Salam. Number one, there are three zikrs of the tongue. These are the extra zikr, beyond what you have to do in terms of your farz, wajib, sunnah, ibadah. Understand? All right. Three zikrs of the tongue. The first is called recitation of Qur'an. Second is istighfar, to recite hundred times. Astaghfirullah, rabbi min kulli ranbi wa atubu ilayh. And third is Dhrur Chief Salawat, to recite hundred times. Allahumma salli ala sayyiduna Muhammad wa ala ala sayyiduna Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Fourth is... Uh, these are three zikrs of the tongue. Then there are two zikrs of the heart. The first zikr of the heart is to try to remember Allah Ta'ala in your heart. Try to constantly be aware of Him, conscious of Him. Try never to let yourself forget Him. And this is a constant exercise a person should do it throughout the day and night. And the second zikr of the heart is to sit down for 10-15 minutes. For the beginner, it's easier to do it before or after salah. And to try to forget the world and only remember Allah. Try to forget the world and only remember Allah. How? By focusing on the zikr of Allah Ta'ala's name. Which name? His ism Zad, ism Azam, ism Jalala, Allah. But not focusing on that name with your tongue, but by focusing on that name with your heart. So this is silent inner remembrance of the name of Allah from your spiritual heart, from your qalb. In Arabic, this is called muraqama. So here, this was a question from the online woman. So you can... Uh, there are many talks we have on this online. In fact, very quickly, I will just point you to some resources. Those of you interested in today's topic more, so on our website, Islamic Spirituality, we have four workshops there. We're just on this topic. One workshop is called Bida and Sunnah in the Islamic tradition. That's four or five hours just on the topic of Bida, which is more detailed than I gave you today. Then there's another workshop called Understanding the Sawuf. That's, if I remember, seven hours just on the topic of the history, theory, practice of the Sawuf. Then if you go on the Islamic Spirituality website, there's two series of talks that come under South Africa at Tikaf 2014. I hope they're there in an easier way in South Africa at Takaf 2015. And it's called Majalis. So 2014 Majalis and 2015 Majalis, they explain these things that we talked about. Methods of Zikr, practices of Zikr, ways of Zikr, concept of Tazkir. All right? So that is the best we were able to do for you. Jazakumullah khair, salam jazakumullah khair, salam jazakumullah khair, salam jazakumullah khair, salam